So continuing on with combustible gas sensors. Combustible gas sensors are used to detect what is referred to as LEL of a gas. LEL is known as the lower explosive limit. What LEL is, is it's the minimum amount of gas by volume needed to cause an explosion. Anything below the LEL of a gas, you will not have an explosion because there's not enough of the gas present to cause an explosion. There's also a term called UEL. UEL is the upper explosive limit of a gas. This is actually an area where there is so much gas that you cannot have an explosion because there is not enough oxygen present to cause an explosion due to the amount of gas present. Why do we use LEL instead of percent by volume for combustible gases? That's because every gas has its own LEL and UEL. Right here you can see methane. It has an LEL of 5% by volume in an environment and a UEL of 15% by volume in an environment. That means if you have 5 to 15% methane in your environment, you're in an explosive environment. All it needs is an ignition source to cause an explosion. Now, if we look at propane, propane has an LEL of 2.1% by volume and an UEL of 9.5% by volume. As you can see, those are two very different numbers. So instead of reporting combustible gases as percent by volume, we report them as percent LEL because that's a universal measurement and it lets you know when how close you are to entering your danger zone where all you need is a source of ignition to cause an explosion. The first type of combustible gas sensor we'll go over is what's called the catalytic bead sensor. This sensor is based off of a Wheatstone bridge te uh, technology. What a Wheatstone bridge is, is it's two pairs of resistors that are bridged together and a change in the total resistance on either side will cause a voltage to be read across that bridge. Now, a catalytic bead sensor has two resistors that are inside of the sensor, not exposed to anything. That's R1 and R2 in this picture. Now, each side of the bridge also has a resistor that's exposed to the environment. That's a catalytically active resistor shown on the upper left and the inactive re reference resistor which is shown on the bottom left. Now, this is what an actual catalytic bead sensor looks like. The reference bead is the inactive bead. This bead is coated in a silicone-based glass coating and is used as a temperature reference for the environment. The active bead is covered in a ceramic coating and is a exposed to the environment and will react with gases present. Both of these beads are heated internally by these platinum wires that you see pointed to. Now what happens is as that active bead comes into contact with any sort of combustible, it'll actually oxidize that combustible, which in turn heats that active bead. When that active bead is heated, the resistance of that bead changes. That change in resistance is, comes across as a voltage on the bridge between the two resistor pairs. And that voltage is read as your percent LEL. This is a very active uh, measurement for gas detection, and it's been around for a long time. It's a very tried and true measurement. One of the features of a catalytic bead sensor is they're actually susceptible to oversaturation. What that means is that if that 
active feed is exposed to an environment that has over 100% LEL, it actually will become an ambiguous and inaccurate reading. A gas detector that utilizes catalytic feed sensors should have some sort of warning for that. Uh, I know that at least one manufacturer has a setting in their detectors where if the catalytic feed sensor is exposed to over 100% LEL, that sensor will actually lock up. And that's to let anyone using it know that you can no longer trust that sensor reading because it's now in an environment where it is not going to be accurate. The most common breakdown of features of a catalytic feed sensor are shown on the screen here. Catalytic feed sensors definitely have a lower initial cost than an IR type sensor because there's less involved in it. Uh, catalytic feed sensors will come with a three-year warranty and they usually have a life expect expectancy of three to five years. Now that expectancy is very dependent on its environmental conditions and exposure levels. If this is a sensor that is exposed to elevated LELs for its entire life, that will degrade the sensor faster than a sensor that occasionally sees LELs. Catalytic bead sensors also require regular calibrations because they're a consumable type sensor. Catalytic bead sensors are also poisoned by silicones. Now, that's because if silicones are exposed to that active bead, they'll actually start depositing on that bead, forming a coating that insulates it from the environment and then makes and basically poisons the sensor so that it'll no longer react to a combustible environment. Once that happens, that sensor needs to be replaced because it's no longer going to be functional. The catalytic bead sensor also requires a minimum of 10% 10 to 15% oxygen to operate. If you have below that oxygen level, that oxidation of the active bead will actually not take place at all. So without oxygen present, this sensor won't be able to read combustibles. And again, if it sees above 100% LEL, the readings start becoming inaccurate and ambiguous and you can't trust in that environment. And one of the most important things to remember about catalytic bead sensors is that if you have hydrogen gas present, you must use a catalytic bead to detect it. The infrared sensor will not work on hydrogen. I'll explain why that is here in a second when we start talking about infrared sensors. At this point, are there any questions about catalytic bead sensors? All right. In that case, I'm going to move on to infrared sensors. So the way an infrared sensor works is it's actually using a attribute of combustible gases that is, I find actually rather interesting. A combustible gas will absorb IR energy. So if you've ever seen a picture of a thermal camera showing a propane tank leak, you see a big black cloud. The reason that that is such a dark color is that that propane is actually stripping all the IR energy out of the image. The, um, now, that each combustible gas will absorb a different wavelength of IR energy at different amounts. So we use that to detect different types of gases. The way an IR sensor works is there will be an IR source inside of the sensor. That IR source will shine a beam of IR energy through a window into the environment. That window will bounce off of a mirror 
go back through that window and go to a beam splitter. And that beam splitter will split that IR beam into two different halves and send it to two different detectors. Now, what that beam splitter is doing is it's splitting that IR beam in between, into a group of wavelengths that will be affected by combustible gases and be absorbed by combustible gases and a beam that is outside of the wavelengths that are absorbed by combustible gases. The one that's outside of the wavelength absorbed by combustible gases is known as the reference beam, and that goes to the reference detector. The one that's in the wavelength of combustible gases is sent to the analytical detector, and that's the beam that's going to actually tell us how much gas is present. The way that works is when there is a combustible gas in that atmosphere in between the window and the mirror, as that beam goes through it, that combustible gas is going to strip off some of that IR energy at the wavelength that corresponds to the gas. That analytical detector will then see a weaker beam than what the IR source actually output while that reference detector is going to see the full power of the beam that the IR source uh, sent out. This difference in signal strength seen by the detectors is what's used to figure out how much gas is present. The internal electronics of the sensor will use that, the differential in those signal strengths to output a signal uh, that is correlated to the percent LEL present. Another job of that reference detector is that reference detector will let the sensor know if there's any sort of blockage or buildup that's going to degradate the signal of that IR source. It does that by any time the reference beam starts dropping in power, it'll alert that it is something is obscuring that beam outside of the combustible gas and prompt you to go look at the sensor and clean off any buildup or make sure there's nothing physically in the way of that sensor. IR sensors should have a couple common features. There should be some sort of a heater built into the mirror and the glass inside of the sensor. That'll be utilized to prevent high humidity environments from condensating on either the glass or the mirror and fogging up the mirror to allow the sensor to keep working even in those high humidity environments. There should also be a physical guard of some sort that blocks the mirror and the glass from having any buildup or anything physically dropping in between them to block out that signal, causing the sensor to not work. There should also be a calibration port on that sensor guard so that there's no disassembly required to calibrate and you're able to calibrate a sensor without taking it offline and without doing any physical work to the sensor. So the basic points of an infrared type sensor is that they are going to be a higher initial cost. That is because these have much more involved in the sensor as well as being a larger physical sensor than the catalytic bead type sensor. There's a five-year warranty on infrared sensors. And I know that we actually warranty the IR source for 10 years. Life expectancy of these sensors is 10 plus years because it's just an LED shining a light. There's nothing being consumed in these sensors, so there's nothing that gets worn away on them as they age. And instead of regular calibrations, you need a re yearly re-zeroing of these sensors just to verify that, yes, it's seeing true zero and it's seeing true levels. These sensors don't aren't 
poisoned by silicones or any other gases because there's nothing that's physically interacting with the combustible gases or the environment. It's just that being a light. And because there's no physical interaction, there's actually no oxygen requirement. So these can be used in nitrogen environments, things like that, where there actually isn't going to be oxygen um, available. And these also allow for true volumetric measurements for some compounds because it's actually stripping out that IR energy. It's not just a, an oxidation re, uh, reaction. And here you can see quick comparison of the two different technologies. Uh, at this point, are there any questions on either catalytic bead sensors or infrared sensors? Give it a minute for anyone to type in the chat. All right, moving on. The next type of sensor technology we'll talk about is the last one, and that's electrochemical sensors. Electrochemical sensors are going to be your toxic sensors, your oxygen sensors. And you can see here, I have a breakdown of a couple common toxics that we look for, which are H2S, carbon monoxide, chlorine, chlorine dioxide, sulfur dioxide, hydrogen cyanide, and ammonia. Now there are multiple other gases that we can detect with toxic sensors, but they're a very they're more um, rare and they're more small applications. So the way an electrochemical sensor works is it's essentially a battery. The sensor is filled with an electrolyte that is specific to the gas that you're looking for. So in this example, we are looking for hydrogen sulfide. As hydrogen sulfide comes in contact with that sensing electrode, it actually will send electrons down to the counter electrode depending on how much hydrogen sulfide is present. That signal is read as a uh, millivoltage, which is sent to an amplifier inside of the sensor, which converts it to a signal that can be read by the transmitter. Now, because that electrolyte is specific to a gas, these sensors are gas specific. So unlike the cat catalytic bead or the IR sensor, which can be used to detect any combustible and you just adjust the reading for the combustible gas that you're looking for, these actually have to be gas specific to get the correct electrolyte inside of the sensor. The other big difference between electrochemical sensors and the combustible sensors is that instead of reading a percentage, these sensors read in ppm or parts per million. The reason that's done is because 1% by volume is 10,000 parts per million. And the, the breakdown of these gases that are toxics are all read in these low ppm ranges. So the TWA, which is the time weighted average, is read in 10 ppm. If that was percent by volume, that'd be 0.001%, which is a number that seems small and don't, people wouldn't be alarmed by, but it's actually the max level you're allowed to be exposed to at eight hours a day for 40 hours a week with no ill effects. Um, these TWAs, the STL and the PEL here are all OSHA limits. So the difference is the time weighted average is how much you can be exposed to eight hours a day for 40 hours a week indefinitely and not see any ill effects. The STEL, which is a short-term exposure limit, is a 15-minute level that you can be exposed to. And 
be okay. Now, this cannot exceed your time-weighted average exposure. So if there is a short-term exposure, you have to shorten the amount of time you're exposed to the gas. The one uh, electrochemical sensor that actually is still red in percent is oxygen. And that's because normal oxygen is 20.8% by volume in the air. So if you're reading that in PPM, that'd be 20,800 uh, PPM of oxygen, which is an absurdly large number. And again, hard to comprehend as far as when you should be worried. These effects here are again, OSHA guidelines, and this is for oxygen deficiency. So as you see, as you start losing oxygen, you start having more and more issues. Um, the flip side of that is we actually will have excess oxygen detection too. Now, why this is an issue is because as the oxygen in the environment increases, things can actually ignite and burn faster at lower temperatures. So you, a lot of people will want to alarm to let them know there's a leak to mitigate and prevent fire and explosion hazards. But it can also be used to help prevent increased operating costs. If you're using can, uh, canned oxygen and an oxygen system, any elevated oxygen in the environment can will indicate that there's a leak in the system. That means there's oxygen being released that doesn't need to be released, and it's money you're spending that you don't have to. Um, so that's basics of how an electrochemical sensor works. Are there any questions on that? Again, I'll give chat a couple minutes for anyone to uh, type in any questions they have. All right, uh, we're gonna move on to calibration. So a question that I know I've gotten a lot is why do you have to calibrate sensors? And why you have to calibrate sensors is because both the catalytic bead and electric, electrochemical sensors are consumable sensors. That means that they are physically interacting with the gases that are present and are using either that active bead in the catalytic bead or that electrolyte in the electrochemical sensor. As those things are used, that sensor will start to drift. Now what drift is, is it means that it can either be offset a little bit, so it'll read at zero, it'll read a little bit of a reading, or it'll become a little bit numb to reading. So at a, a, an elevated level, it won't re report the full level. It'll report a number that's lower. By calibrating your sensors regularly, you keep exposing it to zero and span gases that will teach the sensor, okay, if I see this amount of gas, I know I need to report this amount of gas. If you don't do that, a drifting sensor will start causing false alarms. And as false alarms happen, people stop responding to, to alarms as actively. The other reason you want to calibrate is that if that sensor is physically blocked from the environment, it will never respond, but you might not know that it's blocked. There are some new technologies out there where sensors are actually self-monitoring and they can help to alert you if that sensor is blocked. This will help push out calibration times because you no longer have to worry about whether or not the sensor is actually reading the environment or not. Another reason to calibrate is if there's any environmental changes. So these sensors are calibrated 
or at least should be calibrated under the conditions that they're going to be used. Because things like humidity and temperature and other gases present can cause that sensor to read differently. So you should never calibrate a sensor in a controlled, clean environment and then put it into work somewhere. You should have it running in an environment where it will be detecting when you calibrate. Now, how often should you calibrate? There, depending on the sensor technology used, you can get away with up to 18 months between calibrations. But that's depending on the technology used. You can't just use that on every sensor. If your sensor doesn't do things like self-monitor for blockages, you won't ever know that that sensor is not working if you don't try and calibrate it. That being said, the common rules of thumb for a electrochemical or a catalytic bead sensor is you need to start calibrate that on startup. Now, most sensors you don't want to install and calibrate immediately. Most sensors you want to give it a little bit of time to warm them and start working correctly. Anytime you change out a sensor, so once a sensor becomes old and no longer functional and you replace it, you're going to want to calibrate that sensor after it's warmed up. Anytime you have a large level of gas exposed to the sensor, you'll also want to calibrate then. Um, in the case of the catalytic bead, if there's over 100% LEL, you're going to be forced to uh, calibrate if it does lock up in that safety condition. Most common out there is quarterly calibration. That's just something that's been done for a long time. But there are some new technologies out there that have pushed out calibrations to a year for any type of sensor and will actually alert when a calibration is needed. Now, for the IR sensors, a calibrate at least once a year. But again, because there's no physical interaction with the environment or with a gas you're detecting, it doesn't have that consumable, it doesn't have that drift. So that's why it doesn't need that quarterly calibration that the electrochemical and catalytic bead sensors will. All right, um, I was asked how much warm-up time should be allowed before performing an initial calibration of a new sensor. That's actually gonna be dependent on the manufacturer and the type of sensor. Um, there's the, the electrochemicals usually require a little longer warm up time than the catalytic bead. Um, but again, it's any device you're using or any device you want to use, the rep or the manufacturer should be able to tell you by sensor technology and by what sensor you're using how long that needs to be allowed to warm up before you calibrate it. I know that there's also devices out there now that will do a self countdown when a sensor is installed and that countdown will change depending on sensor and won't allow you to actually interact or calibrate or anything like that until that sensor has been warmed up and is operating to help prevent uh, premature calibrations. Um, are there any other questions as far as the general nature of calibration? I'll give the chat a minute to, uh, to type up any questions I have. Uh, I was asked, what are the typical power requirements for both types of sensors? That, again, is going to be manufacturer and sensor dependent. Uh, general rule of thumb, the, most, the ones that consume the most power are IR sensors because there's a lot of electronics in that sensor and it's actually creating a light beam. As far as, and then the next 
one is going to be a catalytic bead because of that heating of the beads. And then the ones that consume the least amount of power are the electrochemical sensors. Um, again, it's going to be manufacturer specific for how much those uh, power levels are used. Uh, so I'm not sure what if there's a general rule of thumb uh, as far as power levels go. Um, and I was asked again what the warm up time is. Again, that's going to be sensor specific and manufacturer specific. So there's no real, um, there's no general overruling of how long a warm up is. Okay. Um, now we're going to move on to sensor placement guidelines. So there are some general rules of thumb on where to put place a sensor. The the only way to know for sure where to place a sensor is to have a full guess and site survey done. And that will take into effect air flows, it'll take into account the physical structure of the building and all the factors that go into gas detection. That being said, there are some just general rules of thumb guidelines that you can go by. Um, the number one thing to consider when placing your sensors is what is the gas you're detecting and what are its physical properties. If you're detecting something that's heavier than air, such as a propane or carbon dioxide, you're going to want that sensor 6 to 12 inches off the ground because that gas is going to pull down at the floor because that's because it's heavier than air. You should take a look around and see if there's any physical depressions in the floor or any open pits because anywhere where that gas can get as low as possible is where it'll collect. So you should put it, a sensor there for heavier than air gases. For gases that are similar to air, generally we see those placed between four and six feet because that's your breathing level. And if you're looking for something that's going to be about the same weight as air, you're going to want to know when it's in your breathing level. For anything that's lighter than air, such as hydrogen or methane, you're going to want to put those sensors 6 to 12 inches from those ceiling. You want those up top because since the gas is lighter than air, it's going to collect it up top. The, you also want to look for the exact opposite that you did with heavier than air. Look for if it's a slope roof where the most likely place for a lighter than air gas to accumulate is. So if you've got a peaked roof, you're going to want that sensor up closer to the peak not down where the roof starts because the gas is going to collect up at that peak. Um, you're also going to want to place this sensor close to where you think that gas is going to come from. So if you've got a bunch of tanks of a uh, gas, such as nitrogen, you'll want to put that sensor over by those tanks because that's where it'll leak. If you have a pipe that's running through the building and there are physical flanges in connection, that's much more likely to leak than a place where the pipe is a straight welded pipe. You want to prevent these things from being submerged or getting coated with a heavy dust or anything that will block that sensor. You're also going to want to avoid any fresh air intakes or any doors to the outside that are going to be opening regularly. Because what's going to happen is if there's a source of fresh air blowing across that sensor the entire time, it's only going to detect that fresh air and it'll be blinded to what is actually happening in the environment. Uh, you also don't want these things mounted near a something that's going to spew out consistent dust that can clog up that sensor. And again, blind it from the environment that it's trying to monitor. The uh, I also have a couple of examples in here to help demonstrate this. So here's a monitoring for a couple different types of gas. 
We've got a methane sensor in here, an oxygen sensor, an H2S sensor, and a petroleum vapor sensor. You'll notice that the H2S and the petroleum vapor sensors are both mounted down low because both those gases are heavier than air. You'll also notice they're mounted down below the stairs because that's the lowest area in this room so that any gas that is on the platform above is going to flow down past these sensors. You'll see that the oxygen sensor is mounted about face level because you're worried about the air where you're breathing. And then you'll see the methane sensor is mounted way up by the ceiling because the methane is going to accumulate up there in this picture. What we always suggest doing is using remote sensor technology to mount a sensor, like in this example, up at the top of that room, and keeping the transmitter down around face level so that you can see what's going on in that sensor without using a ladder or a scissor lift. You, you also want that calibration port on the methane sensor up there because you can connect tubing to it and run it down to that transmitter, which you can kind of see running on that vertical pipe. What that allows you to do is calibrate this sensor without having to, again, get a scissor lift or a giant ladder. So this is, this is what we like to see if someone is doing monitoring for multiple gases and is taking into account the physical properties of the gas. Another thing you want to take into account is the environment that these sensors are going to be mounted, that these sensors are going to be mounted in. Um, I would just ask, is a transmitter the box that left the O2 sensor in that photo? Yeah, so in this picture, only the methane sensor has a remote mount. So that sensor is remote mounted to the left, uh, the top left of the four in the picture. That's a transmitter for the methane sensor. That oxygen sensor is mounted integrally because it's face level. And then they chose to mount the H2S center, sensor and the petroleum vapor sensor, sensor integrally as well because it's mounted at a height that isn't in, super inconvenient and they're easy to get to. Um, a, there are technologies out there that would allow you to remote mount all these sensors to two transmitters instead of having to have a transmitter for each sensor. Uh, but they, they went with a transmitter for every sensor on this one. Um, moving on to worrying about the environment. So where these sensors are sensing is an area that has actually flooded in the past in this application. So what they've done is they've actually gone with a pumped module system. So on the left picture, that white thing that you see hanging from the tube is actually a consumable filter, desiccant filter. And that tube going up is a sample line. So if this room floods, that desiccant filter will prevent any water from going into this tube. And then after the room empties out, we'll need to replace that to operate again. But that will actually save these sensors because if these sensors become submerged, they're more than likely going to destroy the sensor. As you can see in the picture here, that tubing comes up from that sample port through the H2S sensor on the left and through the LEL sensor on the right. So it's brought up through the H2S sensor through the pump, the pump then exhausts through the LEL sensor, and then that's exhausted to a safe area. This is used in any environment where you're worried about uh, flooding, or if it's an environment where you're worried about the sensor being physically damaged by either heat or damaged by any sort of physical activity in the area you do a sample system like this that allows you to pull a sample to an area where the sensors aren't going to be submerged or where they're not going to be in the way and allows you to monitor without actually worrying about physically destroying anything. Um, 
the distance that you can remote draw a sample is again going to be manufacturer dependent because it all comes down to that pump module, how strong it is, and what environmental conditions the sensors are looking for so that you don't overpressurize a sensor. Um, is there any questions on this? Yeah, I was asked, uh, these sensors appear to be large and robust to withstand wear and tear in the field. Is there a type of sensor that is smaller, safer use inside the laboratory hood? Maybe the sample line that you showed would be a solution for this. So, yeah, we, if you're looking, if you're in a tight area where you can't physically fit one of these sensors, we would recommend going a pump module like this. Um, there might be smaller sensors out there, but the issue that you can run into with a smaller sensor is things like shorter life um, and not being as robust. Um, that being said, yeah, I've I've actually mount done this personally for customers in a lab environment where they've gone both directions. I've had customers just mount the sensor inside of the hood and mount the transmitter outside. I've also had customers do the uh, sample draw system. So it kind of comes down to application specific at that point. All right, with that being said, that's the basics of how these sensors work and things to think about when you uh, are looking at these sensors. If you have any other questions, feel free to throw them in the chat right now. I'm going to be available for a while, so I'm happy to answer any questions now. If you can think of any questions later, either email me or your local Gilson rep, and we can go over this. Uh, in detail with you guys. Again, if you want PDH credits, please post your name and your PE number in the chat, and those will be sent out uh, later today. And with that, I'll. Um, I was asked if I would email this presentation. Um, reach out to your local Gilson rep, and they'll email you this presentation. Um, because there's a lot of people that were on this list and I don't want to bomb everyone with a PDA, with a um, giant uh, PowerPoint presentation if they don't want it. Oh, uh, for, and the presentation will also be on Gilson's website. Someone asked why you can't use catalytic bead for hydrogen, because hydrogen does not absorb IR energy. And the reason that is, is hydrogen's valence electron shell is actually full. So it doesn't absorb, it doesn't strip electrons out of the IR wavelength. The rest of combustible set, uh, gases, their outer valence electron shells are not full. And they're actually stripping electrons from that IR beam to fill out their shell. And that's why they absorb IR energy and hydrogen doesn't. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Any other questions? All right. Um, well, I appreciate everyone's time. I will get the PDH credits out to you later today. And again, if you can think of any other questions, feel free to contact me or your local Gilson rep. And uh, that being said, everyone stay safe and have a great day.